Okay, so very welcome to this first uh, voluntary webinar uh, of 2024. So in this webinar, we have the great pleasure to have Laurie Foster from IAVE, the International Association for Volunteering Effort. Laurie, she is uh, the director of corporate strategies for, for IAVE. She facilitates networks of the global volunteering leaders in what they call the GCVC, the Global Corporate Volunteer Council. And also she uh, is the director and the co-author of the Corporate Volunteering of a Post-Pandemic World, which is the great global research on corporate volunteering that IAVE has done between uh, 2020 and 2022 that was published um, last year. So, uh, Laurie, thank you very much for being here and for sharing with us um, the skill base and the other trends of uh, the corporate volunteering in the global world. And uh, I just don't want to take you any more time. So really, thank you very much for being here. This will be a very participative um, webinar. So if you have any questions, just write them on the chat or just turn on the micro. Um, Laurie, I give you the floor and very welcome to in voluntary. Thank you so much, Benedetta. And buenas tardes, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, I love working with voluntary. It's uh, been years and years, and I enjoy it very much. So happy to talk to you about what we've learned about corporate volunteering overall and skills-based volunteering in particular. So let's get started uh, with the next slide. Um, I will tell you that we conducted um, Let's see. Oh, I can do that. Yes, good. Okay. So the, the piece of research that we did was an update to IAVE's research from 12 years ago about global corporate volunteering. And for this, um, we had a team of 10 people located around the world. And I must tell you that Benedetta was one of our research team members and my favorite so um, we had people in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in China, and we did it in two parts. The first part looked at major issues and trends, and the second part looked at the state of health of volunteering in each of the six regions of the world. And at the end of the presentation, we have the links which I'm happy to have you download. Um, it's, it's all for the good. And we also have the executive summary in Spanish, which I've given to Benedetta if you'd like that as well. Um, we conducted over about close to 200 interviews uh, with 80 different companies from around the world. And um, let me see, let me go back here. And um, including not only corporate people, but also um, uh, NGO leaders, because we wanted to get their views. They're the par partner of corporate volunteers, so we wanted to get their views as well. So 80 companies in 32 countries, covering, we believe, about 8 million employees. So let me get right into, let's see, I'm having trouble. Oops, there we go. So um, one of the things that we found right off the bat since we were doing this research during the time of COVID is that corporate volunteering proved to be very resilient and adaptable. There were many ways that corporate employees just met the moment. The world is locked down, but corporate employees met the moment. For example, there was a lot of localized volunteering. People couldn't leave their homes, uh, but they helped their neighbors. And then once things opened up a bit, they started to go out and do some things that mattered. For example, the Canadian firm TELUS, which is the picture of the people with the wheelbarrows right below, they grew gardens uh, in their homes uh, to feed hungry people, and then they distributed the food. Uh, one of the Spanish companies I know you know well, Iberdrola, their employees worked on making face masks for the deaf with a, a place so that they could um, have lip reading. That was a very unique uh, activity. 
Um, also, there were skills employed by volunteers to meet the health crisis. Al Turkey is a company in Saudi Arabia, and their technically oriented employees work to develop a way to determine if people going into emergency rooms had washed their hands before they went in. Microsoft employees in the United States, in the state of Washington, managed a vaccination site for a full month. It was the largest vaccination site uh, in the US, and they staffed that for months and months. And that's the, the picture in the upper corner. Also, what we saw during the pandemic is that companies gave significant help to their help NG. To their NG in particular, in particular, State Street uh, worked with um, their partners and gave their executives gave uh, coaching to their partners, to the partners' leadership. For example, they worked on financial uh, issues, on business continuity, on leadership development, and they also advanced grants to their partners so that they could survive during the pandemic. So overall, what we saw was a great deal of adaptability um, in, in making it through the pandemic with corporate volunteering. The next thing we saw uh, were a lot of new models were starting to evolve uh, after the pandemic in corporate volunteering. What I'm starting to realize is that corporate volunteering really is not the same as it was prior to the pandemic. Because people shut down, uh, virtual volunteering evolved into doing some really innovative things. For example, there's a, a medical device company in the US called Medtronic, and they used virtual volunteering to start what they called a volunteer power hour. And they were located in 44 countries and they would pick a date and have five different online platforms where their employees could volunteer for that day for one hour. So they would be things like UN Volunteers or Career, Career Village or Amnesty International. So they were so, they got such great participation that they are continuing that. They started to do it just once and now they do it four times a year. Another model perhaps you've heard of is hackathons. And SAP in Germany, for example, got employees to work together to determine how hospitals in Germany could determine electronically where there were empty um, beds in the emergency rooms of hospitals. Um, also, Airbus uses ha the hackathon model and different teams, again, of engineers work together to develop a new hand washing station for the IFRC. And they became very competitive with each other and were eager to continue using the hackathon model in what they have developed as um, something called humanity labs, all staffed by volunteers solving problems. Another model that emerged, perhaps you're familiar with this, um, although I see it more in the US, it's called lunch and learn. So during a lunch hour, employees, now that they're back together in many instances, would hear from an NGO leader on a topic such as hunger or poverty um, or social inequity and learn about it, read about it, hear lectures, so that when they're preparing uh, to create new volunteer programs, they understand the issues underlying them. We also saw a renewed interest or in heightened interest uh, in climate action and also social equity. And we saw that younger employees, and this was all around the world, are pushing their companies to do more in all areas, but particularly in these two areas. And these came about through um, cleanups, uh, volunteer cleanups. There are lots of uh, tree planting programs underway. And in social equity, it's a lot harder, um, but we saw some really interesting work in Australia with a partner, an NGO partner called Jawan, J-A-W-U-N, and they work for indigenous rights. And there are a few organizations, a bank, an oil company in Australia, where they have their employees work with Jawan for six weeks. It's a secondment of six weeks 
but they work on the projects that the indigenous community selects and that they lead. And it's been uh, quite a successful, successful program. The other theme that we found um, is that there has been an expansion of what Ayave calls the big tent. And this was uh, a phrase that my colleague Ken Allen um, coined uh, years ago when he did research called the big tent. And what it means is volunteering beyond corporate volunteers. So they're corporate volunteer programs, but they include frequently family, friends, uh, relatives, uh, uh, the community. In the case of um, one of your members, uh, when, and also one of our members, uh, Kasha Bank, they include retirees in organizing a big program of volunteers, which I think is very impressive. Uh, we also have Modelo in uh, Mexico has created a platform so they include the entire communities uh, in volunteering. So we saw an expansion of the big tent during COVID and beyond. Other companies uh, like Dell Technologies include their customers. Bank of America includes their customers. So we say, think this is a great model for showing the benefits of volunteering. I should say I'm happy at any point to, to answer any questions. So um, don't feel that you're interrupting. I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I'll keep going. So uh, the other thing we found uh, through our research, and this is this is really worldwide, is an increased focus on impact. Uh, you all are very familiar. I know voluntaries did great work on the sustainable development goals, educating people about them, talking about how volunteering can contribute to them. We saw a heightened interest in that. Also, um, in certain countries, particularly in Africa and Asia, an interest in national development goals, which are getting people out of poverty, working on educational um, initiatives and so forth. But one of the things we we found in our research, we asked in every case, and I have to tell you, we had 46 questions, I think, in our questionnaire for each company. So um, we really went pretty deep. But one of the things we asked is, who is your volunteer program for? Is it for the company, for employees, or for the communities you seek to serve? The first time we did this research 12 years ago, it was overwhelmingly for communities. This time, we were a little surprised, it was overwhelmingly for employees. And that's because what we're seeing is that there are many benefits to employees volunteering, as, as many of you probably know. The wellness, the employee wellness benefits, the leadership development, the team cohesion, there are many, many benefits to it. And we see companies focusing on those benefits, making those benefits explicit. But we really hope that they don't lose sight of the, the communities as well. Finally, and you probably know this too, um, and we saw it around the world, everyone is trying to measure the outcome on communities. And it's tricky because there's no uniform way. Uh, there've been initiatives that have tried, <laughs> but um, it, the, the search goes on. In our research, we found, to be quite honest, very few companies who are truly measuring more than volunteer hours, really looking at the outcomes of the programs on beneficiaries, but the search does continue. So um, what we found around the world um, from, from Kenya to Honduras to Switzerland is an increased focus in every company on more skills-based volunteering. And what we found, of course, is that volunteering really varies um, by region, by country. Um, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, but religion plays a part in many countries on the motivations for volunteering. Uh, in the Middle East, Islam is an important factor as well. Um, during Ramadan, uh, their holy month of, of fasting and prayer, um, mo that's when most companies in the Middle East do their employee volunteering. Uh, we also found that government regulations and uh, incentives play a part in the type and amount of volunteering. So in India, 
corporate social responsibility is a requirement of all major companies. Um, in other countries, there are tax benefits to employee volunteering in France. Um, there is uh, a big tax benefit if there's a secondment of an employee to an NGO. So this in South Africa as well, there's a, a big uh, incentive to volunteer. So this shapes the kinds of programs, but again, in every country um, that we, and every company we talk to, the percentage of volunteering is increasing. And I have here um, a couple of different examples to show you how different skills-based volunteering can be. Uh, I had a company ask me um, earlier this month, what is your definition of skills-based volunteering? So I sent them the chapter that we wrote <laughs> on skills-based volunteering because it really depends. Traditionally, um, skills-based volunteering has been uh, pro bono work that is done frequently by lawyers and accountants. It's a requirement uh, for lawyers. And the, uh, the UK company uh, Link Letters is a law firm, and their employees do quite a bit of pro bono work. For example, they worked, those, those lawyers worked to make uh, climate change reason for asylum for an individual. They also work with individual refugees who are seeking asylum, uh, and they put in hours and hours, um, I think 30,000 hours um, in one period of time uh, on this type of traditional skills-based volunteering. Other companies make um, their skills-based volunteering their signature program, in other words, something that aligns very much with their business. So AIA Film is an insurance company in the Philippines, and their signature program is financial literacy. So their employees and their agents will work to go into schools, uh, both uh, secondary schools and universities, to teach a pretty involved curriculum on financial literacy. Additionally, the head of their foundation um, work to, to lobby the government, and this is a bit unusual in corporate volunteer, but lobbied the Philippines government to make financial literacy a requirement in their uh, secondary schools. Another way of uh, skills-based volunteering, we saw this actually evolve uh, during the pandemic. A company in, um, I believe it's Honduras, uh, no, excuse me, Peru, uh, Belcor, Belcor worked with um, also UNICEF and uh, AB InBev in uh, Peru to support the small microenterprises in the country. And in Peru, microenterprises make up 84% of the businesses. So this was significant. But they would coach them to help them get through the pandemic. They'd help them on branding and marketing, and they would do it online. And it was a pretty significant uh, project, which is ongoing. So the Belcor employees, the Belcor is a beauty beauty firm similar to um, Avon. Um, they sell uh, individual cosmetics and other beauty products. So these were entrepreneurs themselves coaching micro enterprises on entrepreneurial skills. And it's been quite a, a successful program helping these companies stay in business and support their families. We also see, and this is a little bit less talked about uh, with skills-based volunteering, that it could be vocational skills. So Marriott, the hotel chain, has um, their chefs teach culinary skills to underserved populations. So um, immigrants and refugees, um, uh, people from poorer communities, children who may have uh, dropped out of, of secondary school, they teach them how to become chefs. Uh, and, and other uh, vocational skills. So that we believe is an, another good example of skills-based volunteering. We also see a lot of technology, maybe unsurprisingly, technology used in skills-based volunteering increasingly. And we saw it with uh, the cellular company MTN Ghana. They had a pretty extensive program throughout the country teaching STEM, science, technology, and education to get more young people interested in those fields. 
Uh, Google has a program called uh, Google.org Fellows. And what they do is an embed a team of employees for up to between four and six months and teach NGO, their NGO partners, how to use technologies. For example, they embedded employees in an organization uh, and taught them how to use technology to spot and stop um, child trafficking. They also had a program where they embedded an employee to work with the state of California to be able in the US to look at wildfire prevention. So good use of their technologies. IBM has a program called Skills Build where they um, employees will commit, and this is a bit unusual for a full year to look at and help individuals learn technology who perhaps don't want to go through traditional university to get a job, but help train them enough to help them get employment. And finally, what we saw also is collaborative support, a little bit rarer, but there are some good examples. And one is the Berlin Social Academy, which is a collaboration of about nine companies, both large and small, in the city of Berlin, Germany. And what they do every year, even during COVID, COVID did, they did it virtually, but now they're back to in-person and they take a solid week and work with all the NGOs who want to in the city of Berlin. And they teach them, they do one-on-one -on -one coaching on financial issues, on marketing, on web design. They have seminars, they have podcasts, but they all come together to uh, help strengthen the NGO community. Uh, in the city of Berlin. So those are some examples of, of what I've seen uh, through our research and in particular with skills-based volunteering. And now I really want to know how you are leveraging your employee skills or how you as NGOs are partnering with companies to leverage um, employee skills in volunteering. Who wants to talk first? Don't be shy. Just turn on the, the mi microphone, or if you prefer, you just can write it on the chat and we will read it to the audience. But I, I know that many of you have very, very good programs, so please share them. Oh, yes, I can't go anywhere without asking um, what employees do. And I have to say, I was in Korea in October. And there's a steel company there where I asked them about their skills based volunteering and they have employees who their hobby is scuba diving. And they have a very established program where every month these employees go out and clean a waterway in in the town of Seoul, Korea. Um, and they do it over and over, and that is their skills-based volunteering program. Not their work skills, not building steel, but scuba diving and cleaning the waterways. So that's why I always ask. I learn something new every, every time. How are you defining skills-based volunteering and what, what, programs, what programs do you have? I can go first if I if Thank I may. You, Paula. Um, here in Amadeus for the Spain and Portugal market, we've uh, we've been running some initiatives. Uh, some of them, for example, we had a group of people, a group of employees, and they shared their professional experience and background with the students from different educational centers. Uh, with the idea to give more ideas about the different scenarios and different options that the students will have when they need to choose uh, the training itinerary, uh, the training paths and their career options in the future. Uh, other initiatives that we have so far is job counseling. So we run a mentoring program between some a, a group of employees and a group of long-term employed people. And the idea is that employees can share um, their knowledge about how to make a CV, how to manage a job interview, um, things like that. 
And also we want to run another program to, to help students, to help children with their English uh, classes. So this is something that we would like to, to run this year in collaboration with a group of, of employees as well. Oh, that's great, Paula. May I ask you, do you provide any specific training for employees before they do this, this coaching and training? I wouldn't say a training itself, and maybe an in like a briefing or, or an informative session. And mm -hmm. this is delivered by the entity that we collaborate with, just to give them an overview of the program, the main purpose, and also what is expected from them and how they need to deliver or facilitate the different sessions in the case of the job counseling program or the or the talk that the employees um, give in the different educational center. But it's not a training like that. It's like a more just an informal session initially. Yeah. Right. Sounds mm -hmm. great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paula. Lori, also for you to know here in Spain, unemployment is really the big thing. And also mm -hmm. because we are facing this paradox that we have the highest number of vacancies and also the highest rate of unemployment. So there is really a lack of match between uh, like uh, what people study or the, what they are, the, the skills are and uh, so the academic and uh, the job requirements. So it's really, really something that is getting bigger, I would say uh, in Spain and like in most of Europe. So it's really useful, those kind of program as uh, Amadeus one, which helps people like to connect with uh, between academic and uh, the professional sectors. Excellent, that's important work. Andrea? Okay, uh, hello. Um, regarding, as you mentioned, Benedetta, uh, employability, um, what we, um, we do uh, in Workforce Social, um, we promote pro bono marathons. I guess you know uh, this format, Laurie. And uh, this year we implemented uh, one innovation uh, with one enterprise. Um, in a pro bono marathon, we included people that were looking for a job and, the, and together they worked with the employees of the company and in a team they uh, provided consultancy to an NGO and after the session, um, the people uh, mm -hmm. from the company gave um, feedback to those who were looking for a job as a way to, to, to give them um, more confidence on their skills. And it actually worked very well. It was uh, very nice and interesting. And actually, they were very young, uh, and it was very helpful for them and for uh -huh. the NGO. That's great. And which company are you with, Andrea? Uh, I can't say the the name of the company because they don't uh, give uh, they don't they don't announce their sustainability programs. Oh. Uh, Right. Sorry. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I'm just curious, but that's wonderful. That's so it's really a collaborative uh, a project. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see who else want to share their program. I can, so Benedetta. Thank I can. you. Thank you. I'm Chell. Hello, Laurie. Can you feel me OK? I can, yes. Ah, you cannot see me. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not working very well, the camera. Let me change it and see. OK, I'm here. So nice presentation, Laurie. Thank you so much for your sharings. Um, mm -hmm. You know pretty much about Kai Shaman and how is our program and all the details, but I want to share with the group um, a special thing that we have done this year that I think is so nice. And is the agreement that we have done with ONCE. ONCE is the Spanish organization for the blind people. And mm -hmm. the reason why we have, we have been collaborating with them is in terms of our professional skills, 
is because um, not only because of the time that our people can share with them, you know, for going uh, for a walk or sharing just time with blind people. No, the, the main reason why I want to share that is because they have asked us because of the professional people that we have, that we can be their eyes just to read the papers that they receive by mail. They say that people with a financial background, probably they will, they will be um, more precise in helping them to understand if they receive a letter from the government or a letter from another bank or a letter from whatever thing that it's administrative or legal or anything so that most of these letters, they cannot be read by a blind people if they don't have this, the program and everything. But if somebody else can be their eyes reading those papers, this is the main, I would say, the main matter why we have done this, this collaboration with La Once. And I think it's a, it's a very, very nice program that, that we are just, we have more or less 100 uh, different volunteers with different activities and all around Spain in different places in Spain. And we are trying to, to see how it's working and how the people is doing their correct match each other with the blind and with one of our collaborators. I love that. I, yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's so Actually, nice. yeah. So that, that topic is very close to my heart because my volunteer work is... Um, training guide dogs for the blind but the oh, dogs don't read financial statements no so. no no that's no. wonderful that's, that's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, how, we, how many hours would you say would an employee work with a blind person we don't set a number of hours what we have set is a number of time we are telling our volunteers to be enrolled for at least two three months and see how the things are going so that the people, they don't feel like they have to have, you know, a very strong commitment to doing or, or to spend a lot of hours for them. So commit for just two, three months, see how it works. We do the matching with the people from La Once, that is the Spanish organization, and with, with our people, we do the matching, the requirements of the person that needs the assistance and, and the availability of our, of our people. And then if they want to renew the agreement or the collaboration, they can do that. And and they, I mean, the people, they get organized as they want, you know. If they want to do it on the weekends, they do it on the weekends. If they want to visit the people or stay with them during the week, it's something that is very easy to organize because it's, it's a, an agreement with two people. So it's very easy. And we also train them because you have to be trained to be, right. uh, you know, uh, in in a relation with with a blind people because sometimes we touch our we touch in Spain, you know, Lori, we touch us pretty much, but you yeah. cannot touch a blind people without telling them because he is not expecting you to be touched because he's not seeing you. Things like right. these details, you know, that things that are easy to. Um, to teach the people how uh, how you have to manage when one of the blind people uh, has a dog because you are working with the dog and you stop and the worker stop the dog also stops. So uh, I mean there's special rules that the people from La Once is is um, is helping our people to learn how they have been in contact with with their community and with they call them af affiliados but well. well with the with their community we can say wonderful wonderful thank yeah. you for sharing that very that's that's unique that is very unique thank you so much wonderful thank you very much Shell. um someone else let's use here don't be shy Wonder is anyone using employees' hobbies? Yeah. Or vocational skills? Laurie, I haven't uh, heard of 
at least uh, I'm Selena work with Benedetta. Uh, we're in contact with with many with many companies, and actually I don't remember any one of them doing that. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if you have like any experience that you want to share uh, about using vocational skills and personal skills of the volunteers mm -hmm. because usually uh, companies try to channel uh, the skill-based programs into something that is related to the core business of the company but it would be really interesting like to have that personal side uh, those other skills that are not so much linked to their professional job so I don't know if you can give us information about that. So besides the scuba diving, there was an instance in Canada, again, uh, the Canadian company TELUS, they had employees who were teaching um, mothers of uh, children that were hard of hearing, taught them baby sign language, which apparently is a very specific <laughs> kind of sign language. So um, things like that. Um, but yeah, um, gardening skills, I I did see that as well. Um, I would say music, sorry. What do you think? Yeah, I would say that there are like music band and then they play for 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 leisure, but also like for hospital and for I think this I saw uh, I think a couple of times like around music. There are a lot of things, and sometimes maybe also sports group like internal company sports group and they they then do some kind of inviting uh, other beneficiaries or ngos to join their sports and i'm just thinking something else you're right so nike uh the sports company they have their frontline retail employees um, and they train them to become uh, children's coaches for sports because they feel that uh, a children a child's experience with the sport really has an uh, the quality of the coach has an impact on the, the child's experience. So they have a really extensive training program for these employees who are already probably pretty athletic. Uh, and they have to commit to a full year and they give them paid time off to volunteer to be to be a coach. So you're right, Benedict, that reminded me of of Nike's program, which is which is quite good. Thanks. That's really interesting. Andrea, you're. I've I've been I've worked also with makeup artists of a company. Some of them were professionals, but some of them uh, were people from the from other area of the company. But they have done the makeup as well. So something. Oh, interesting. Interesting. And maybe also theaters. Uh, I'm, I, I just can't remember the company, but I heard about like some theaters classes or this kind of um, this kind of uh, acting left with uh, people for disabilities or just uh, doing a play for a social entity. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I think the point is. Um, whatever an employee whatever skill they have <laughs> they can use uh, to make a difference and you've you've indicated some great examples in your company and addressing youth unemployability is huge um huge it's a priority in africa uh, many countries in asia um actually much of the world to be honest it's uh, an important important thing to work on So uh, I wanted to let you know um, our report, parts one and two. Um, the first part is about all the issues and trends, and you can download it by chapter. For example, there's a chapter on skills-based volunteering. There's a chapter on, on how companies dealt with COVID. Um, there's a chapter on cross-border volunteering. Feel free to download it. Um, my email's there. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is my favorite topic. so. Happy to talk to you about it. Um, I appreciate your attention. Um, we were pretty excited about this research, so uh, thank you for letting me share it with you. Thank you very much, uh, Lori. Uh, Laura, I think you raised your hand. Do you, do you want to, to ask a question? I don't know. Laura? No, maybe it was a mistake. 
So uh, really, thank you very much, Laurie. We will share your presentation. We will upload the recording of, of the, um, the webinar in our uh, Voluteca. And uh, see you very soon, Laurie. Okay. <laughs> From many Bye. other collaborations this year. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.